Thank you for that, ladies. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to take them and go to the book of Acts, chapter number 17, is where we'll find our text this morning, Acts chapter number 17. And uh, we are continuing our series uh, here in the book of Acts. And uh, so again, if you've, once you've found your place and if you're physically able to, I'd invite you to stand as we read uh, the scripture for this morning. And so again, I invite you to stand with me. Acts chapter number 17, again, is where we find our text this morning. We'll begin reading in verse number 16. And we'll read down through verse number 23, uh, but we will preach, uh, Lord willing, through the end of the chapter. The Bible says in verse number 16 of Acts chapter number 17, Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God's help this morning, I'd like to preach to you a message I've simply entitled, A Righteous Man in a Confused World. A Righteous Man in a Confused World. Of course, Paul, in our text, would be the righteous man. The Athenians, the men and women of Athens, would represent the confusion that is so prevalent in our world today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for Sundays, the opportunity we have to worship you. We thank you for the greatest story that has ever been told the birth of a little child in a manger in Bethlehem. Lord, to a, to a young gal who, Lord, was a virgin. Lord, his birth, of course, would introduce him to our world. And, of course, he would live a sinless life and he would die on a cross. He would be buried and he would rise again. Lord, it's still the same message that we're preaching today all these years later. We pray that you'd help us as we preach it. Lord, fill me, I pray, with your Spirit's power. Lord, I pray that the audience would also have a filling, that they would listen. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today that does not know Christ as their personal Savior, the message would be clear. Lord, that they would respond to a simple invitation, that you do a real work in hearts and lives here today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The Telegraph, which is a newspaper in the United Kingdom, recently polled a group of people in Great Britain, about things they found the most confusing. The very top of the list, I had to chuckle when I first uh, read this article, the very top of the list, the things that uh, those in Great Britain thought was the most confusing in our world today was this, foreign call centers. I thought, I can identify with that. Have you ever tried to call someone about something, a bill perhaps, or uh, maybe an online order that you placed, or maybe something in your home that's not quite working right, and when the person picks up on the other line, they speak English, but just barely. Have you ever had to deal with something like that? It can be very frustrating. Uh, Ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying, and I feel just as bad for her because she probably doesn't understand what I'm saying either. So those in Great Britain, they thought, man, who invented something like that? Who is the first person to say, why don't we have someone who speaks English as their third or fourth language communicate with all these people in the United States of America about their problems and their issues over the phone? I, I had to chuckle when I first saw that. The last list went on to say the second thing on the list of things that was most confusing to Englanders was algebra. I think I can identify with them as well in that. Further down the list, Englanders were confused about the process of buying a house, credit card interest rates and how those things might work. They were confused about politics and the political system. Here's another thing they were confused about, converting currency. 
I was recently in Canada and, and uh, spending some time there and, and uh, I was going to make a purchase and before I made the purchase, I had to pull my phone out and I had to do the, uh, what the exchange rate was and figure out, okay, how much is this going to really cost me in United States dollars, in American dollars? And, and so they said that was a confusing thing for them. And also on that list was filling out insurance forms. Yeah, all of those things can certainly be quite confusing. Several years ago, we were visiting, I was visiting Eastern Europe, and, and uh, we, had, we had really made kind of a, a round trip. We had spent some time in Hungary, and then we'd gone into Romania, and we'd gone up to uh, Slovakia for a night, and then we had traveled to Vienna, Austria, and we had spent some time there, and uh, we had to go back to Budapest to catch our flight the next morning. And, um, and the missionaries that uh, we had staying at with, with, their, with them was uh, Jim and Laura Pranger. Most of us would maybe be familiar with that name. They're missionary son out of our church. And we had been at their house at the beginning of the trip, and now we were going to end up at their house at the end of the trip before flying out the next morning. And, uh, and, and so we, we drove, it was a little bit later at night, and we drove into the city of Budapest, and we thought we had entered the right address into our GPS. Emphasis there on the word thought, because we had not entered the right address at all, and and, uh, and we got to the certain part of town. It was dark. It was a foreign city to us. We had, we had really only been there one time, and, and we didn't know where we were going. And we saw this grocery store that we knew was right around the corner from their house. The name of the store was Tesco. We said, oh, there's the Tesco. We must be close because we, we were just here a week ago, and we know they lived right around the corner from a Tesco. And we searched, and we searched, and yet we could not find that house. Well, most men, most men will not ask for directions, but eventually we had to. It was getting late at night, and our flight was early the next morning, so I finally I called Brother Pranger on the phone, and I said, hey, I said, we're right by the Tesco, but we can't find your house. And he said, Pastor Pete, I hate to share this with you. He said, but there are hundreds of Tescos in the city of Budapest, Hungary. It, you, chances are you're really not by our house. And he said, give me the address you have on your GPS. And we gave it to him, and he began to laugh. That, you never want to hear that. You never want to hear that. He said, yeah, you're at the opposite end of town. And he said, I'll see you in about 35, 40 minutes. And, and uh, so eventually we made it there. The confusion, that's a, uh, that's a frustrating thing to be confused, to not know where, uh, where, where you are, where you should be, to not know maybe where you should be going. And, and the end is we think about a confused world, we understand that it, the problem is so much deeper than just needing to ask for some physical directions or a physical address. The problem is so much greater than just the frustration that comes by picking up a phone and dialing it, and the person on the other end uh, perhaps doesn't speak English as their original or their first language, and perhaps they have a, a heavy or thick accent, which makes it hard to understand. When I speak about a confused world, I'm talking about something so much greater uh, than the confusion that we've referenced here. I'm talking about a confusion of who God is. How can he be known? Where can we find him? Does he exist at all? And, and how do we really know that he exists? We've never, we've never seen him with our physical eyes. We've never heard him with our literal ears. We've never touched him. We've never handled him. How do we know for sure that there really is a God. A simple Google search of does God exist will give you 5,450,000 results. If you try typing in is God real, I did it this, this, uh, earlier this week, you'll find 268 million different results on Google, on the internet. People asking the question, is God real? Does God exist? And how can we know him if he is, you know, this is not a new question. In fact, in our text, we find the city of Athens, the men, the philosophers in the city of Athens wrestling with the same question. Now, this question is not really even relegated to the uneducated. For we find that the city of Athens was one of the most well-educated groups of people in all of the world. Now, the, uh, the, the, the city of Athens was known as the intellectual capital in the world at the time, it was the home of Socrates and Plato, two great philosophers. It was a university city where much learning and education went on, and, and it was filled with cynicism, and it was filled with pride and arrogance against the less educated or perhaps the completely uneducated. In other words, if you had not spent a certain time in some uh, place of higher learning, then you really didn't have much to say, and we really aren't all that interested in, in your philosophy or your viewpoint. 
Uh, Athens was the home of art. It was the home of literature. It was the home of oratory and religion. It was the home of mathematics. And it was also the home of political science. Athens, here, listen, Athens illustrates well what knowledge amounts to apart from God. For the Bible tells us in this passage of Scripture that they had so many gods, they even erected a god and they put an inscription upon his altar and they basically said to the unknown God. In other words, just in case we've missed one, we wouldn't want to offend him. If he's out there somewhere, we're worshiping you too. We don't know who you are. We don't know where you exist or how you exist. We don't even know that you exist at all. But just in case you're out there, we've got an altar for you as well. Paul's writing in the book of Romans might best describe the Athenians when he says this in Romans 1.22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Athens was convinced that they had all of the answers and that they were the authority on everything. And yet Paul's assessment of them was just the opposite. He said, I perceive in all things you are too superstitious. While Athens was a hotbed of learning and education, Athens was spiritually bankrupt. The Athenians worshipped a multiplicity of gods, as I told you a moment ago. And in case there was a god they missed, they made an altar to him as well. For instance, Dionysius was the god for the drunks. Aphrodite was the god of sexual lust and perversion. Hermes was the god of thieves. With gods like these, is it any wonder that the worshipers were lacking in morals and downright confused as a culture and as a society? I'd like for us to consider this morning Paul's time in Athens. For we see a vivid illustration of a righteous man in a confused environment. I'm here to tell you that not much has changed over the past 2,000 years. Confusion in our world still seems to reign supreme. And the righteous, as God's people, we must step up if there is to be deliverance from confusion and acknowledgement of God. I want you to notice a few things in this passage of Scripture. Number one, I want us to consider the anger of a righteous man. We learn of this in verse number 16 where the Bible says, Now Paul, now while Paul, I should say, waited for, that, uh, for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. Now the Bible tells us in Acts 17 and verse number 16, that his spirit was stirred in him. The word spirit uh, is a Greek word. It's a medical term that occurs only here and in one other place. The other place in the New Testament appears is 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number 5, where Paul says that love is not easily provoked. And so the word stirred and the word provoked here are one in the same. Uh, here's, here's basically what this means. It means this, that Paul was filled with a righteous indignation as he looked around at all of the gods that filled the city of Athens. And as he saw all of the immorality and all of the wickedness and as he saw all of the confusion, he was filled with anger. And you ask yourself the question, Paul, who are you mad at? Who are you angry with? Are you angry with the priest down at the local temple in which men and women come into this place not to worship God but to satisfy their own fleshly lusts? Is that who you're angry at? And Paul would have told you, I'm not angry at the priest. We'd ask Paul, well, who are you angry at? Are you angry at the, at the political leaders in this city that uh, that, that, that allow wickedness and, and evil and wretchedness, that allow these things to, to go on and to transpire. Are you mad at the political leaders in the city of Athens? Paul would have said, I'm not mad at the political leaders here in the city of Athens. Oh, I know who you're mad at, Paul. You're angry and stirred and filled with wrath at the men who sit up there on Mars Hill, the philosophers who literally spend their whole day just to, uh, just to learn some new thing or to tell some new thing. That's who you're mad at, right? Paul would have said, no, I'm not mad at any of those people. Paul would have said, I'm not mad at a man or a woman, but I have a hatred and a disdain for the devil, for Satan who, who has twisted what God has tried to do 
who has turned man against God and, and, and who has taken man's sin nature and carried it to a level that was never certainly intended to be. Paul would have said, I'm not mad at the priest and I'm not mad at the governor or at the mayor or the president. I'm not mad at, at the philosophers, the educators in the university, the professors and the teachers. No, no, Paul would have said, I'm mad at the devil himself. Amen. And I'm afraid we as Christians sometimes get that mixed up. That we, we have a frustration, we have an anger that rises within us. It's a righteous anger. It bothers us when we see wickedness going on in our society, in our culture. When we see it being perpetuated and it being allowed. And we, we even see it being celebrated. And we're filled with anger at perhaps maybe some elected political leader. Or maybe we're filled with anger at some, some movie maker in Hollywood that he would produce a movie that has this type of thing in it or this type of language. In reality, our anger oftentimes is a misplaced anger. Or I think that our anger ought to be directed at the devil himself. Paul's anger was directed at Satan. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I want you to know that Satan's greatest work is to put blinders on lost humanity that they might never see Christ. And that's what angered Paul. That's what stirred him up. That's what provoked him. You know, as we sit here this morning, I, I hope you hate the devil. I hope you don't hate your neighbor. I hope you don't hate your father or mother or your brother or sister who... Maybe you're carrying on all types of wickedness and terrible living. I hope you don't hate a political party or, or somebody that has a philosophy that's different than yours. I, I hope you hate Satan. I hope you hate the devil. Every time I, I hear of a husband leaving his wife or a wife leaving her husband or I hear of a child who's gone astray or every time I hear of a little child who, who gets cancer or some other terrible disease that a man or a woman might contract. It ought to well up within all of us a hatred for the devil because he started all of this with his, with his lies and with his deceit there in the Garden of Eden. May God help us when we're filled with anger, as we oftentimes are, for it to be directed at the right place and the right source. For I propose to you that if you have an anger and a hatred and a, and a, and a frustration with your, with your neighbor or your family member or a coworker, you have a very hard time reaching them with the gospel. But if you have an anger at the devil, you understand the reason why this person does what they do. The reason why they say what they say and they participate in what they participate in is because the devil has blinded their eyes as the God of this world. May God help us to hate the devil. Listen, not just to hate the devil in the lives of other people. May God help us to hate the devil in our own lives as well. For far too often, we as Christians sometimes cozy up to sin and temptation. We dabble and play games with the devil ourselves. We open up the door to temptation and to wickedness and to evil. May God help us. We see here Paul, this righteous man, in a confused world, we see, first of all, his anger, but notice, secondly, his argument. The Bible says in verse number 17, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue. Now listen, Paul didn't just get upset. His anger moved him to action. He actively, the Bible says, disputed and debated, or maybe we could use the word argued with those in Athens that they might repent of their idolatry and that they might believe in Jesus. You can understand why Paul was so stirred by this. Paul was a Jew. And the first, uh, first couple of, t of commandments given by God to the Jewish people were about, were about other gods. A thou shalt have no other gods before thee. And, and here's Paul. He walks into this city, and, and it's, it's ingrained in him as an individual and as a person. It's part of his culture. It's part of his people. And he looks around, and he sees a God dedicated to every single thing that you can possibly imagine. And he's filled with anger, and he's stirred, he's provoked. But he didn't just sit on that anger. He didn't allow it to grow within him and to well up. 
and to bother him to the point where he, he, he walked away and did nothing. No, he, he sat down with people and he disputed with them. He tried to show them the truth. He asked the question, who do you argue with? The Bible tells us. He argued with the Jews in the synagogue in verse number 17. It says, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. This was customary for him. We've, dis- we've, uh, we've established this in this series that we've been in the book of Acts. That everywhere Paul went, if there was a synagogue, he would go into it. And he would meet with the Jews and he would preach Christ. And we see that he also argued with the devout persons. That Paul was not intimidated, intimidated by men of influence, by men of wealth and means, by men who sat in heavy and lofty positions, whether they were businessmen or women, whether they were po- politicians, whether they were doctors or lawyers. Uh, Paul would go to them. Paul would dispute with them. Uh, he did not hesitate in going to devout persons. But I want you to notice thirdly that he also, he also debated and disputed and shared the gospel with ordinary people who were just doing ordinary things. Notice the end of verse number 17 and in the market daily with them that met with him. In other words, listen, Paul had a well-rounded ministry. See, in our day and age, we have churches that minister to inner city type populations. We have churches that minister in the suburbs and filled with businessmen and women that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. We have churches perhaps that are planted in political places where men of great influence and responsibility live and reside and they're geared to reach them. And Paul said this, Paul says, God has sent me to reach everyone with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I personally think a church ought to be filled with every type of person you can possibly imagine. I think a church ought to have some poor people in it. Uh, By the way, Jesus himself was poor. The Bible is very clear about that. I think a church ought to have perhaps some people of some means to, uh, to give and to help and to maybe even to give those that are less fortunate in their life. Maybe it's, I, I got a goal in life. I, I want to I do something. I want to accomplish something in my life. I think the church ought to be filled with old people and young people alike. I think the church ought to be filled with all different races and all different cultures. And God brings us all together and God unites us and binds us to himself. I believe very strongly in that. Paul's ministry and his arguing was not just limited to a specific group of people. No, no, he took the gospel to everyone he could. But notice, what did he argue for? We learn of this in verse number 18. Now the Bible says, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods. Notice, because he preached unto them Jesus. I want you to notice, first of all, he preached unto them Jesus. In other words, what did he argue about? Some of us, we argue about sports teams. We argue about geographical locations. Florida's better. No, Arizona's better. No, California. We we argue about everything, don't we? We argue about what kind of brand of car you're going to drive. Oh, you drive a Ford, I drive a Chevy. I, you know, or I don't drive an American made, I drive this. I drive. We, we argue about everything. You shop there, oh, I don't shop there, I shop here. You like that restaurant? Well, let me tell you about a bad experience I had at that restaurant. I eat here instead. Don't we do that? We argue about everything. Why do you, why do you go to that dentist? Why do you let that woman cut your hair? Why do you do this? Why do you? We argue about everything. Paul says, Paul says listen, I'm not going to argue about, I'm not going to argue about football teams. I'm not going to argue about track stars. I'm not going to argue about what country's better. I'm going I'm to tell you about Jesus. Man, maybe, maybe we just ought to go back to just telling people about Jesus. You know, I, I know that um, people can be sensitive about certain things. And sometimes we, we, can, we can trigger their, their sensitivity with some things that we say and, and that sort of thing. But you know what? You're, you're never wrong when you preach Jesus to someone. Even if, the, even if they don't like it, even if they don't appreciate it, even if they get offended, bothered, or upset, as long as you've done it in the right spirit and with the right attitude, you are never wrong arguing Jesus with someone. The Epicureans were a school of philosophy founded by Epicurus. The Epicureans held that indulgence was the key to life and that pleasure was the highest good. They believed in the gods, but they believed that the gods were basically disinterested in mankind. So in other words, as they walked past the gods there in Athens, they they saw them, they acknowledged them, but they basically said, these gods really don't care about how we're living and what we're doing. And we can basically carry on and do just about anything that we want because 
Pleasure is the highest good. In other words, their philosophy was live for the here and now. Enjoy as much as you can right now here in this world because really we have no idea what lies beyond the grave. They were confused. The Stoics, on the other hand, were founded by Zeno of Cyprus. They were fatalists and pantheists. Their chief belief was that man should live according to nature. And they believed in morality, uh, in, but virtue or good works was the supreme good in life as far as they were concerned. In other words, this was the group that was working their way to heaven. Everything that they did, in their minds they thought to themselves, well, everything that, I, that I'm doing today, it, it's got to help me to climb this ladder to heaven. It's got to, to help me to get to some, some form of perfection as I see it to be. And, and I think to myself, well, look, we, we don't have Epicureans and we don't have Stoics still in our world today as far as that name is concerned, but we have both of those philosophies. We have a segment of our society that is just living for indulgence. They're living for pleasure whether it's getting drunk or whether it's fulfilling their fleshly lusts or whether it's making lots of money and having the newest toys and gadgets and living in the nicest communities and neighborhoods. Uh, these, uh, these folks are, 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 are filled with this desire for, for things. And we have a group of people also that is laboring under this false premise and this frustration that they can work their way to heaven that they can do enough good, that they can say enough nice things and do enough good works and maybe give enough money away and deny themselves enough to be able to earn themselves a, a seat in heaven. And Paul confronted both of them. He preached Jesus when they called Paul a, a babbler. In this passage of Scripture in verse number 17, this was a word Greeks used to describe the feeding habits of birds. As it applied in this sense, it is spoken of Paul as though he had picked up this scrap of information in another place and was now trying to present this scrappy religion to them and, and, and what he had to say could not possibly appeal to men as intellectual as they were. In other words, they fancying themselves as philosophers and as well-educated, well, um, they thought, man, we are dining in a phil philosophical sense. We are dining on steak, and we are dining on the nicest meals. And this guy, he's, he's nothing but a little bird that's picked up a few seeds somewhere, and he's trying to give this to us. And we have something so much better to eat and something so much better to offer than he could ever offer. And that term, a babbler, was not a compliment, but it was a slam. It was a negative and yet, nevertheless, Paul continued to preach Jesus. He is the only message that we have. I, I say be careful about a man who talks too much about himself. Be careful about a preacher who talks too much about himself or what he thinks. Have you ever spent a lot of time with someone who's constantly saying, well, I think. Well, let me tell you what I believe. But be careful about that. Several years ago, I was discipling a man and um, he was a new Christian. I'd led him to Christ. And, and he would ask lots of questions. And almost every time he'd ask a question, I'd say, well, take your Bible. Let's go here. Or here's what the Bible says. And it, I, I, could not have, I could not make this up. He looked at me finally and he said, let me ask you this question. He said, why do you always say the Bible says? I thought, man, what a great question. Why do I always say what the Bible says? Because, sir, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what this person says or what that person says. What really matters is what does this book say? Amen. You see, we've got a world that is living their lives based upon what so-and-so says and based upon whether well, culture's doing this and the world says this is okay. But we, we, we as God's people, we must live our lives based upon what this book says. Amen. The truth of God's word. He preached unto them Jesus. Notice, secondly, he preached unto them the resurrection it says, because he preached unto them Jesus in the resurrection, verse number 18. You know, this is the heart and soul of the Christian message. Jesus lives. I challenge you to think about this philosophy of working your way to heaven, of trying to get there on your own, of going to church enough times, of doing enough good deeds, of giving enough money away. I challenge you to think about the cross. Think about our Savior who's beaten and bloodied and bruised. Think about him as he hangs there, suspended between heaven and earth. The Bible says that he hung there naked in shame. Think about him as he cries out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As he cries out, I thirst. 
as he, as, he, as he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he ultimately and finally cries out, it is finished. And ask yourself the question, if you, could, if you could go to church enough times, if you could give enough money away, if you could be good enough, if you could be kind enough, if you could love enough, then why would he have to go through that? Why would he have to subject himself to that? Why would the father put his son through that ordeal, through that pain, and through that suffering? No, listen, the message has always been and will always be Jesus Christ saves and him alone. But listen, it doesn't stop at the cross. The Bible says that they took his body down. They wrapped him in linen and they placed him in a borrowed tomb. Some have said that they borrowed a tomb because they knew he wasn't going to be there long. I don't necessarily know that I agree with that. In fact, if you look at his followers, they didn't have a whole lot of confidence that he was going to come up out of that tomb. But God uses unusual circumstances and unusual things, and sometimes he uses us, and we have no idea what we're doing, but God uses us in our ignorance anyways. They put him in that borrowed tomb, and the Bible tells us three days and three nights he laid there. And on the morning of that third day, he began to stir, and the stone was rolled away by the angel, and Jesus Christ arose in victory and in power, and Paul preached the resurrection. He said, you walk by these gods every single day. God's made of stone. God's made of wood. God's made of silver and gold. They can't talk to you. They can't speak. They can't hear you. And yet there is a God, a living God, a Savior who came to this earth, who was crucified, who was, who was killed. He died and he was buried. And yet three days he rose again. And you spent your whole life following after these gods that don't even exist. Can you possibly be any more confused than that? And Paul preached to them the resurrection. I want you to notice, thirdly, we see not only the anger of a righteous man, and we see the argument of a righteous man, but lastly, I want you to notice the announcement of a righteous man. Notice verse 23, the Bible says this, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Notice this next phrase, Him declare I unto you. Paul says, you know, you could not have done anything better for me today than to have that altar there with that inscription of the unknown God. Because God has sent me here to let you know that he exists, but he does not exist in any of these idols that you guys have created. This, this unknown God that you're, you've been worshiping ignorantly, thinking, well, in case we've missed somebody, he's real. Let me tell you about him. I'm getting ready to declare him unto you. I'm getting ready to announce who this God is. And so you better listen. You better listen well. What did he announce about God? He announced God as creator in verse 24. The Bible says, God that made the world and all things therein. He announced the God of heaven as the creator. Did you know, did you know that both evolution and creationism are essentially religions and faiths? Are you aware of that? You say, how can that possibly be? Well, because not a, not a single person that is alive today was around when this world and this earth was created. And so every last one of us, we believe what we believe based upon faith. I believe that God created the world in six literal days, Amen. and on the seventh day he rested. I believe he spoke everything into existence. I believe that God formed me with his own hands in the, in the womb of my mother. That Listen, that God has a plan and a purpose for my life. I believe those things. Because I believe God's word. And the evolutionist, he believes that all of a sudden one day there was a huge explosion. And everything came to be that is today. And, and that really we have no purpose, we have no mission, we have no goal in life. Because we're all just randomly formed beings and creatures. He wasn't around when his explosion, quote unquote, his explosion happened. And I wasn't around when God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so therefore, both of us believe what we believe based upon faith. I worship the God of the Bible. I believe those who practice and believe in evolution, I believe they worship the God of this world. Amen. A God that is doing everything in his power to blind the eyes of them who do not know who God is. And to use anything in his power. And so he announced God as creator. He announced God as sustainer in verse 25. 
Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Listen, I've already touched on this, but a graven image has no power to give life and to keep life going forward, seeing it has no life to begin with. And graven images are fashioned by man's mind and, and by his own hands. He conjures up this thought in his mind and he, and, he, and he creates this God of his own making. But that God has no life. He's stone. He's, he's wood. He's, he's, uh, he's gold or, or, or silver. Notice, notice number three, he announced God is near. Look at verse 27. That they who should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You know, Paul told the men of Athens, he said, listen, God's not far away. God's very near. You know what I'm here to, t- to, to tell you that are here today? Hey, listen, God's not very far away. God's very near. So how close is God? He's as close as you want him to be. He's right here in this book. He can be right here in your heart and in your life. He's only, listen, he's only a prayer away. God is near. He announced God is real in verse number 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. He says God cannot be contained in a precious jewel. God cannot be contained in a piece of wood or a block stone. He announced God is real. But notice he announced God is judge. Look in verse 30, the Bible says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. You know, for a long time, God winked at the ignorance of the Athenians. He wasn't okay with it, but he allowed it to go on. He suffered it to be so. Paul says that day is over, because I've come with this message You know, it's possible that you might have walked into this room this morning and you've done what you've done in life because that's all you've known. You've not known anything else. You live the way that you live because no one has ever told you to live any differently. And maybe for the vast majority of your life, God has essentially winked at you. Not that he's not planning to judge you, but he's allowed you maybe to get away with some things that you shouldn't have gotten away with. And maybe perhaps by you walking into this building this morning and you hearing a message that maybe a message like this that you've never heard before for the very first time, God says, okay, I'm done winking. It's time now to repent. You've never heard this message, but now you're hearing it. What will you do with what you've heard? Perhaps maybe you've lived the life of an Epicurean. Indulgence is everything. Pleasure, self, what can I do to please me? Perhaps you live the life of a stoic. Oh, I've denied myself much of my life and I've tried to do good and I've tried to be virtuous. You come to this auditorium this morning and you realize God says neither one cuts it. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. It's Jesus Christ hanging on that cross. It's Jesus Christ buried in that tomb. But it's Jesus Christ risen from the dead, alive forevermore. Jesus Christ as judge. This was the announcement of Paul. A righteous man to the Athenians. A confused people. I want you to know something. The message has not changed. Our world is just as confused as it's ever been. And yet, the answer is just as clear as it's ever been. It's Jesus Christ. It's a relationship with him. It's knowing the God of this book. Would you